Good evening, everybody out there. Let's go. Let's begin. I don't tell. Sorry about that. It's right, guys. It was not going to happen. But we are here today to make up for everything lost yesterday. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. All right. We are going to read about the two beasts. Actually, three beasts. Hopefully, by the end of this, you guys will see. A lot of people, when they mention Revelation, they talk about it. Most people know three components from the movies. They know about the, um, the beast. They say the beast, the false prophet, and the, uh, what did they say? The beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist. That's what they say. Right? I want you guys to know what they are. Okay. So we're going to go through everything here to be kind of quick, kind of concise, but hopefully you get it. Hopefully everybody gets it. And because we live in a time where it seems like these characters pop up out of anywhere. We're going to be reading in a Revelation 13. You guys want to follow me there? Revelation 13. The dragon. Let's talk about that guy first. Challenge the dragon. Satan. That old sir. Call the devil and Satan. That's out of Revelation 12. The dragon and the beast. Look identical, save for two crowns. That's the only difference. Tells us a lot. But in the Bible, it says that the world worshiped the dragon. Let me read this verse. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up under the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, his great authority. The dragon did. And it says, And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the he was able to make war with him. Let me pause there. The dragon gave the beast his power, his seat, his great authority. Dragon. So who is this dragon? We know what's seen. But why seven heads? Why ten horns? Right? Well, what is all this stuff? Well, when you read in Revelation, let's talk to, uh, let's go to Revelation, if you would. Revelation 17 gives the interpretation of what this beast is. Revelation is. Isn't that something? If you normally, when you read through the Bible, it will give an explanation as to what these things are. So let me read, let me read what these are. Here's a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, what is he doing here? This angel is telling John, he says, he says, uh, John, why did you marvel? I'll go ahead and tell you the mystery of the woman. This is Revelation 17. It's a beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Well, this beast that has seven heads and ten horns in Revelation 17 is the same one in Revelation. Okay. So John is looking and he says, uh, John is marveling like, what is this? You know, so he's going to, he's going to tell him what this is. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Perdition is doom, going to doom. So it's going to be, this thing is going to be very destructive, right? As it goes forward and it comes out of the bottomless pit. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and the foundation of the world. Did you guys hear that? They go to wonder whose names were never in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, if you're wondering if your name was never in the book of life from the foundation of the world, then guess what? You're wondering, are you a human being? Are you a normal human? And you know what? This sounded all 20 years ago. This sounded weird 20 years ago when I first said it, but it doesn't sound so weird now. Because now you have people saying, well, you know, what am I? I must be part Palladian, part this and part that, right? 
you know what they're saying? They're getting into um, the genome. And a lot of people thought it was exciting how certain blood types were rare. And then all that went out the window. And all that went out the window when the triple helix was found. And they found out what that junk DNA was. And it's not junk DNA. And they know the diversity that's inside human DNA and that the majority of it is not awakened yet. So these people are going to wonder, were they ever a part of the human race? Listen, when they look at this thing, because it says, I'll read it again. This beast that has the um, seven heads, this beast is the same one in Revelation 13, the exact same beast. Let's get that established first. The angel is telling John what this beast actually is. What it is, Revelation 17 is the interpretation of what that beast is. Revelation 17, 8 says, The beast that thou sawest, one, that means it exists, and is not. Now, what does that mean? It was, right? But it is not. And, and then it says, And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, remember, this was, what, 2,000 years ago? And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So it used to be, and in his time it was not yet. In his time this beast was not there. It wasn't there. But it will come out of the bottomless pit. It was not there in John's time. But it was there in times of old. Now, the only thing we have in times of old, different than John's time, is that big gap of time where, you know, these uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and all those guys are walking the earth, right? Some of the, uh, some of the uh, third, fourth, and fifth generation Nephilim, some of those um, big kings. But these people, people, when they behold this, so it, 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 they're going to see it. They're going to see it. They will see it. They're going to see it. You guys hear me? They're going to see this thing. You're going to see it. Now, before any, any of you rationalize this, be careful with it. Be careful. Because number one, not too many people know what truly exists on this earth. So be careful with that. Always tend to leave this in the realm of just where it is, right? Because uh, sometimes you have people that they don't believe anything exists beyond their bubble. And they're going to be sorely mistaken, wrong, and uh, it's not going to work out for them too well, right? When they see a truth, when they start seeing truth, they're not going to be able to handle it. Could just be thankful that the Lord did not introduce everything that does exist uh, in your time, because you would not be able to live normally. So they're going to behold this beast that wants, and is not yet is, right? It will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Revelation 17. Now look, it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen. One is, and the others yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. By the way, that, uh, well, let's continue. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. The book of Daniel also, also outlines this beautifully. beautifully. Uh, in fact, just about all the way through, he's talking about the beast. It's just that people have not, well, I don't want to say it, but because of latest traditions of popularity, certain things are skipped over in the Bible. Nobody reads certain parts of the Bible anymore. I'm nosy. I like it all. Right? I like it all. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So this is funny. The ten kings right, that everybody talks about, the ten kings. In John's time, it says they have received no power as of yet, but they will one hour with the beast. Now that hour... It's during his season, only in his season, with the beast. Now listen to this. 
Because a lot of people say, boy, yeah, those 10 keys, they must be in power now. And be careful with that one, too. Let me read that one more time. And the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as king one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, th you know what? Revelation 17, 14, I could talk about that for days. And the reason why is, so let me open up your eyes to something. John is saying, or this angel told John, these take king, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but will one hour with the beast, they're going to make war with the lamb. The lamb shall overcome them. How in the world are they going to make war with the lamb? Well, then it shows us something, right? They're going to make war with the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called. Sound familiar? They're called the chosen, the faithful. Who are the called, the chosen, and faithful? Many are called, few are chosen. You are the called. You're named the called in the New Testament. The faithful, the faithful ones, the faithful, the ones who are falling, Christ, of course, and the ones who finish the race, of course. So you're looking at believers. Look at the time you live in right now. Does the world system prop up Jesus Christ? Do they worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? No, they worship themselves. They don't worship Christ. Everything they do is against Christ and against his prince. I hate to put it that way, but everything they do is against Christ and his principles. Everything. And if you don't believe that, just keep living in 2024. When things open up and things that were in the dark are brought to the light so that you can see your favorite, uh, you know, popular people, what they really are. It's almost like they make war with the lamb. They're constant. Everything the world does, it seems, that's in policy, politics, corporations, government, the world, so um, means whatever the case is, is against the principles of Christ. It's against, it's sickening. And it's so sickening, it is actually a lot of people can't see it because they're complicit with it. They utilize it. They live within it. They won't renounce it. It is an excuse, a crime, something that people do because they like doing. It is disgusting, is what it is. It's getting worse. So anyway, that was that one. I want you guys to see that. Also, listen, I mean, can be reading this. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These you might war with the lamb. The lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords, king of kings. And they that are with them are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whores sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns, now remember, they're, they're these uh, the ten crowns. There are seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. And he says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Listen, for God had put it in, listen, God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. He put it in their hearts to do this. God did. Wait a minute. God put what in his hearts? Those ten horns which are upon the beast. These ten horns are going to hate the whore. They're going to make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Isn't that what Iran says all the time? Hmm? That's exactly what Iran says all the time, all the time. Isn't that what uh, the other nations surrounding God's holy place? Isn't that the one and the same? Yes, it is. They say that same thing. Didn't God make that declaration in the book of Jeremiah? about his own people, Israel, her flesh would be eaten. Yes, he did. They're not popular, but they're in the Bible, and people refuse to read them for some reason. God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So God put it in the hearts of those with the ten horns. 
to chastise, to do away with, desecrate, decimate, trample underfoot. This woman, God did that, not the devil, the devil. God did that, not the devil. This is God, this is your father's plans, not the devil's plans. <laughs> Hear that? It is in the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. In my opinion, this is one of the most misunderstood scriptures anybody could ever read. See, God already told us he's in charge of the world. Why the world is the world? Is it because of Satan? Absolutely not. It's not because of Satan. If it were just Satan, this earth would have been destroyed a long time ago. But God keeps things going. Why? Remember the verse about the scoffer? But it says, God is not slack concerning his promises, his men count slackness, but as long suffering to us were. To me, to you, and to me, and to everybody else, long suffering, desiring that nobody perish out of him. Remember what he also said. What happens if his own people turn back to him and pray? Then heal the land, correct? So if we can pray, if we can humble ourselves and pray, right? and turn our whole face toward the Lord, then he would heal the land. What would happen if God's, the heart, the heart of God's operation on this earth, what would happen if the heart of his operation turned back to the living God, said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What would happen to the earth? I'll tell you what's, what will happen is the entire earth is going to be remade. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. See how that works? When Israel, when Israel is fully reconciled with the living God, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, period. Are they reconciled yet? They're not. Or are they going to be reconciled after this Jerusalem? Remember, the one that was left out of the measurements, the one, the part that was given to the Gentiles, remember that? The new Jerusalem has not been touched, will descend out of heaven. And then the Bible is called what? The bride of Christ. It's not just some empty building, but it will be occupied. Hmm? And what will happen to the people on the earth when they see it descending? And those who are in the earth and in Israel and those places, when they see the Messiah, what will they say? You put these holes in your hands. That's what's in the Bible. They'll ask him. Who put these holes in your hands? And he'll say, my friends did this to me. See, they didn't even know him. So before anybody, you know, jumps the wagon and says, well, they don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in Christ. They all, they're all going to die wrong. See, Beth did blinded them. But he also said he would keep them. Those who are really his, which means they don't even know him. And they're not going to know him until he returns. And when he returns, they'll ask him, who put these holes in your hands? You know, see, my friends did this to me. Now, why did God blind his own people? So that the power of the holy people could be distributed all throughout the earth. Satan hates, he hates that plan. He does not want that plan. The power of the holy people is like a, a star to him. He's tried everything to separate the blood of the holy people from everybody else, and he failed misery. God blinded his people, and the distribution of the Spirit began. Now it went all over the earth in spiritual form. People have become his people, but he made promises in the beginning, and he's going to keep those promises. That's why the tw 12 tribes are important. The physical 12 tribes are important. The physical 12 tribes have been sustained. They have been absolutely sustained. That's why certain technologies came forward to keep track on those 12 tribes, to make sure they were those 12 tribes. Hmm. So this is our father's plan, not the devil's plan. That's why not one soul should be afraid of the beast. We just ran where God's going to put it in the hearts of those seven horns to give their power to the beast. One hour, they're going to give their power to the beast. Those, though, I'm sorry, those uh, ten kings are going to give their power to the beast one hour. So that what? So that God's will can be completed. Listen, 
for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their king unto the beast, and to the words of God shall be fulfilled. What words? The same words he declared in the book of Jeremiah. Those words. See? Those words. Before you guys do it, 23andmeancestry.com and all that and the other, look at some of the findings of the deep investigations before you start going. Israel is something totally independent from all of that. And they established that. Why? Before anybody else was into DNA, Israel had mastered breaking down, right, DNA. In fact, many new things come from Israel. Okay, so, so keep that in mind. They lead the world in, in tools, certain parsing techniques with DNA. They have searched, located, and retrieved everything. But these, these DNA people, these DNA companies were falsifying so much. They were just falsifying so much. It was, it was kind of a sad story, but they were telling people anything and people were believing it. So is, is, uh, yes, they have lawsuits against them too. When, when somebody sues you for millions of dollars and that happens over and over again, then something went wrong somewhere. Then they found out that the Mormons are collecting all this DNA, storing it in a mountain. So anyway, there you are. Oh, and that, well, I can't go into the word that, well, Mormons, the reason they exist and have somewhat of an impact is because they're not by themselves. It's not really the Mormons. You may as well call that something else. They have a pretty big operation. They store the world's just in case you did not. So we know that's more than faith movement, correct? Much more than a faith movement. We live in wicked times and they have been wicked. More than you know, more than you know. And it's very difficult to go into those stories because it's so different from the popular stuff that you guys are used to hearing. But many things will begin to come out. The two continents, nobody wanted anybody to see strange stories about the waters, the different waters. People are going to start recording two different types of oceans. People are going to start telling about that. One is always calm and one is not. The one that's not is the one that you know, the one that's calm, where you could know it, but nobody's going to travel to see it. And those waters never mix. No, that does not make the uh, correct either. There's just so much that people, some of in then. Must think ancestry is important. Well, not so much ancestry. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. If you made pottery, a very special type of pottery, and there were counterfeits all around you, you would have a somewhat of a catalog of all of what you make, right? Let's say yours would stand up to anything in the imitations, but not. And, everybody, and, and people wanted the original version because they lasted much longer. It, they meant everything. You know, they were the real deal. How would somebody ever get a hold of the original? Well, you, you would catalog certain things and do things in a very strange way, right? You would keep some by not allowing anybody to ever think they ever existed in the first place. But then a presentation is where you're going to present what you had. Of course, you're going to hide some, right? You're going to hide some among older stuff, some among newer stuff. You're going to spread it all over the place. But then when you go to collect everything, all the other pots and things that everybody else made, they'll deteriorate by that time. And only yours is going to withstand the conditions that and you gather them up and put them on display. And there they are. God's people are just like them. Need in a special way. Kept. Kept. Now keep in mind, God can do anything he wants. He did not have to. He, he can undo this mess that we're in right now. You know that. He can undo this mess. So why hasn't he? Why hasn't he? He can undo Satan in a heartbeat. So why didn't he? Why didn't he? Why didn't he undo all this stuff? <laughs> why didn't he? Somebody said God was very peculiar about the blood of us not drinking it, pouring it on the ground, the DNA is something else. Well, he said don't drink the blood because it carries a lie. The original Hebrew, uh, that led over to disease. It kept the, the what's living in an animal 
would then live in you. So that was about disease, right? That was about disease. Not to mingle your blood with certain tribes. You have to remember there were third, fourth, and fifth generation Anakim back during that time. So people like Goliath and Goliath's um, brothers and tribes over here and there, they were still hybrids in the earth. There, there were large hybrid communities in the earth. See, in Genesis 6, when, when, when you read that carefully, you're going to find, I don't say it too much here. I don't say it anywhere because I don't like causing controversy too much. In Genesis 6, it says, there were Nephilim before the flood and also after that. They were before the flood and also after that. Before the flood and also after that. So after the flood, they were still running into things. Joshua, all these guys were running into things. They were all over the earth. There's still Nephilim in the earth right now, a great many Nephilim in the earth right now as we speak. All of them were not giants. They were corrupted, but they were not giants. Now, all of them were not giants. Some were dwarfs, right? But in every case, they were, you call them hyper beings of some type. Hyper. Um, they had very earthly tendencies, very flesh tendencies. In fact, you guys probably like a few of them, but if you don't know who they are, they're full of energy. And if you think you're going to get some feeling about them when you're around them, well, that part could be right. But you won't have an automatic dislike of them. It's not what you're going to have. See, in, in the Bible, if you could discern the presence of those beings, like that, then the Bible would never have to warn you to be careful who you entertain. Because you'd have angels on the earth walking around like people, right? And you have uh, good and bad, right? You have those things walking around. And if you like this world, you can never see. You're, you're never going to discern who is who if you like this world. It's when you have a thirst for righteousness and that the world is truly dark, that you have no joy in anything in this. And what I'm saying is when you don't like the entertainment of the world anymore, when you can see the devil's dealings in just about everything in this world, you're going to see those things behind it, and they will see you. They will see you. So the more you thirst for righteousness, the less you're going to want things of the world. When you read that stick, your eyes are going to be opened to controlling mechanisms behind many things in this world. Something as simple as shopping. You may, you may have an instant disgust towards because you see the mechanisms behind it. But when you do that, all eyeballs are going to be on you. They're going to be on you, right? That's why a lot of people are blind right now. They have not reached that state where they thirst for that much righteousness. And the Lord does that in portion, right? He does. Because if, if, if the average person woke up and all they wanted was righteousness, they would be sick every single day because they know the world just doesn't offer that. And people love darkness. They do. They love darkness. And if you saw that, um, you know, everything that protects these, the dark things in this world would then see you. You'd be highly visible in a fight for your soul every single day. And if you think you have misfortune now, when those things start to see you, you're really going to have misfortune because they are legalists. They are, and they still do these supernatural things, but not you. Right. They do, but not you. It wouldn't be good. So in proportion to your growth, your spiritual growth, the Lord does open your eyes so that when you do see, you're going to be ready to act. God's not going to open the eyes of someone who is just doesn't want to do anything. If your eyes are opened, if you can see them, they can see you. Remember that. Remember that. Please remember that. At any rate, why didn't God remove all this evil stuff from the earth? Well, in Revelation, we can see that he's bringing it to a close, but why go through all this stuff? Why? Can't you see this process is for you? It's for you. This process is all about you. It's all about you. He all about you. See, because God wants children, family, 
if you went to adopt a child, it's taking a big risk when you adopt a child, but there's no guarantee that child is going to love you for who you are. You don't know where they come from, what the culture is, what, what's hardwired into them, follow and so on and so forth. You don't know that. But the day they turn to you instead of their neighbor, they say, well, you know, I'm going to listen to my adopted parents. I love them. I'm not going to listen to you, my neighbor, only my dad, because I respect him and I love him. You'd smile. Right? You smile. If if your child um, got caught in some sort of circumstance in school and the kids, the rest of the kids, right, were listening to some, you know, advisor down the hallway, but yours waited for you to get there to listen to you, you'd smile. When a child picks you, when a child openly loves you, it changes everything. Adopted or not. And they love you freely. They're your child. You adopted the child. That does not mean they're going to love you back. It does not mean they're going to choose you. In some cases in this world, people have adopted children. And when they raised them, the child left. They never saw the child. Again, that happens a lot. In other cases, very rare cases, children get adopted. And the child absolutely loves the parents. And they honor and respect the parents. They do. They appreciate them. They really do love them. That's true family. If a child walks away and they don't care if they see you again, how is that true family? But, but how do you get there in the first place? You want the child to love you, but you can't force a child to love you. We know that's not going to work. That's false. And God being righteous, free, right? He wants family. He's, he's growing up family. And you're part of that family. And when you freely choose him, you're fully accepted. That's why no one can ever be forced to obey the Lord. No one. It's not going to work. That's why at the end of time, you have a lot of people who just don't make it, right? Where do they go? What's well, the story about where they go? What happens? And the ones who, the ones who choose him, who openly choose him, I mean, really choose him, he's going to be their father. Even the ones that you think may not make it. There are people on earth, you may think, oh, well, that person's not going to make it. Be careful with that. Be very careful with that. Because this process, as, as exactly what this process is producing, the truth of all of us, if we in fact freely love the Father as the Father, no one's forcing us to love the Lord. No one is forcing us. And if anybody can love the Lord by faith, in this process, right, where no real proof has been given, where we face great opposition of faith, if anybody can love and respect and honor the Lord and pick him as father and begin to represent him, you know, we removing your sinful things, not being forced, but freely choosing the righteous path. Why? Because it's the path of your father. That what we see in the word of God. Most people try to choose the righteous path because they think they're righteous. And Jesus said, those people are not going to make. That's phony baloney. But when a person chooses that righteous path to honor their father because they love the father, they actually begin to see the father. They're going to end up righteous in the end because they're freely choosing. No one forced them to lay down their sin. That's why it does no good to scare somebody into a submission to be you don't want to God children. Second last, you're going to see a lot of people during this time that you live in right now. They're going to fall away from the faith because they've been forced to go through this routine like church all this time. And they did not want to do it. All that's going to come. And you have people who have been looked at, you know, scarcely, but they really do love the Lord. They just don't look like they love the Lord. And people don't really know. Them. They're going to surprise you. All of it must be by free will. All of it. Remember that. When you're dealing with the Lord, everything is free will. Everything. That's when I tell the admins and those who do things for COT, nothing is obligated. Nothing is obligated. Everything is free will. Or it's not at all. No obligation. That's what destroys relationships, in my opinion, is obligation. And if you take note of something, listen, 
your, your flesh, based on your culture, you could be hardwired for obligation. That's a very dark thing. Just like you know that obligation is a very dark thing. It is very dark. People in this world, they love, they love the atmosphere of ruling over somebody. They like that. And they have expectations they put on people like chains. Expectations are chains. There's no freedom in it, is it? There's no liberty in expectations. Even God does not put expectations on us. He doesn't. And what is our highest example of righteousness? Our Father. He does not put expectations on us. Why not? Why not? Because he wants us to actually learn to do good, to choose him, to choose righteousness. And he's very patient in this process. He didn't kill us from the onset. He didn't kill us halfway. He didn't kill us right now. He could undo us all right now. Remember what he told Moses, I'll get rid of these people and give you a brand new people. In other words, God said, I'll, I'll just erase these people and give you a brand new people. Remember, he told Moses that. Moses said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Remember the people were cutting up, making idols as he went to, to go do his thing in the mountain with the living God. And they were acting just, just terrible. And God said, I will get rid of these people and give you a brand new people. That's what the Lord said to Moses. And Moses said, oh, no, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He interceded. He did. To what God can do. We know. we know he does not need us. He didn't need me, he doesn't need you, he doesn't need anybody else. He loves us. It's a big difference. He does not need us. I hear people all the time, they say, well, you know, God is trying to, he didn't try. God will do or you will not do, but he does not try. We forget that sometimes. This is our process. It's, it's been going on for so long. Because he does not want us to perish. When we're going through this process, we didn't start out righteous. We did not. We started out rebellious. And so he gives us time. And you're going to take note of something. When does that time actually run out? He already told us. There's a certain number of Gentiles that will be included in his. Thank you, Lord. Um, how do we know that we're still in that number? because we believe in Christ. I'm, I'm telling you folks again, even in your company, some of you do not, you, you don't believe in Christ. You can't. Some of you can't. And you know you can't. And it descends a person. And it will cause them to eventually explode if they hang around in these and because they cannot believe in Christ. Now, I still believe in Christ. And that is the seal of God's patience and his love and his mercy and his grace. But when that number is fulfilled, nobody else is going to believe in it. The door will be closing. It'll be closing. More and more, you're starting to notice something peculiar. There are a lot of people who know about the Bible, right? They know the scriptures. Oh, they know them perfectly. They know the procedures like robots. Listen to me. And they follow the Bible like robots, absent the spiritual things. They have no spiritual connection. None. They have none. No spiritual connection to the Word of God. To them, it's just another routine. It is only a way of life that they're testing out to see if it works. And these are the ones who have a, they, they have a finite set of questions. No kidding. Ministers out there, they have to be of age to have encountered these folks, but they ask the exact same questions over and over again. No matter what race they are, what creed they are, whatever they are, these people who are devoid of that belief in Christ, of that measure of faith, they always ask the exact same questions about biblical things, and they're trying to suddenly change the idea of faith. In other words, to them, they'll say, well, it's okay to have the Bible and to read it and this, that, and the other. But the stuff doesn't work. They put it in a practical sense. Fit did of all spiritual anything. 
So you get this conventional word that they utilize. No spiritual power. No miracles. None of that. Oh, they do. Well, I, I guess they, they want to believe in cryptids. They like the aliens and monsters. But spiritual miracles? No. Forgiveness? No, they like the law. Instead of forgiveness, they like the practicality of man's laws. That's with him. So they're trying to subtly strip out the spiritual heart of the word of God. So they're going to keep the Bible. Yes, they talk about the Bible. Yes. But to them, it's just some other tradition, just some way of life. It is devoid of the spirit. They have no connection to the spirit. And it's impossible for them to see Christ. They can't see Christ ever. They can go through the motions, but they're disconnected. The Lord warned us about these in the book of Jude. He said, there's spots in your feasts of charity. That's a dead giveaway. A feast of charity is a gathering of love, a gathering of love. So guess where they are? They're not outside the church. They're inside the church. And you don't know who they are. They don't like spiritual people. They don't. They don't. They don't like that stuff. But, but again, I'm telling you, they cannot see spiritual things. The Lord, he faced the same thing when he came, when he was here. Among his own people, these same individuals were there. They were devoid of the spirit. They could not see spiritual things. That's why he told, told Nicodemus, you know, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But he told him, who would never see the kingdom of God. He told all of who would never see the kingdom of God. But you guys, the majority of you, you believed in Jesus before you knew how to speak. You never questioned the living God. You knew there was a God. You taught the Christ, right? You were the ones that were small and you wanted Christ to come and get you. You remember that? You have other people who are not like that. God gave you a measure of faith. He gave you a belief in him. He did that. He didn't learn that from a book. It's not some learned behavior that you have. It's something you were born with. And that's how you know. Because you have that natural belief in Christ Jesus. Everybody's going to have some kind of God they believe. Not everybody is going to be able to believe in Christ. Not everybody. That's why they hold their head in shame when they behold him. That's why they don't want to see him come. They do. That's their nightmare. Your victory, their nightmare. They don't want to see him. Anyway, these 10 kings, this beast, are, can you guys see that with this? Did, doesn't this mess up this popular image of a woman sitting on some sort of a beast with a sword and she's, you know, she's conquering everything. That's not what it says here in this book. I don't know who drew that picture, but that picture, that picture works against everything in Revelation 17. It does. Now, listen, is it somebody's fault if, if they can't see what Revelation 17 is? No, they just have to inspect the word of God for themselves. Here's what we can do as human beings. This is where we make a mistake. You ready? I'm going to share this with you so you don't make this mistake. You can trust another person so much that you will not, you will not examine the scriptures yourself, but you'll take somebody else's word for it. When I'm reading the word of God, nobody's mouth, nobody's interpretation, nobody's teachings, nobody's anything is in my head. It is me and the Lord, nobody. So it doesn't matter who it was in the world, right? Doesn't matter who it is in the world. That is the, the best theologian, the best preacher, the best this. Their words are not in my head when I'm reading the word of God. A lot of people have not done that. The imagery, and I use the imagery of this woman that sits atop the beast, that image makes it seem like that woman is the friend of the beast. And most people know that woman is what? They'll say it's Babylon. That's not what the word says. It says on her forehead is written mystery Babylon. And anywhere that word is used, mystery, that means hidden. That means nobody would ever suspect that is Babylon. And why did God call a place Babylon other than Babylon in the first place? 
called a place the daughter of Babylon. You guys remember that? Hmm? God even said of his own, God even said of Jerusalem. Wait, wait a minute. Where did Christ die? Somebody tell me that. Where did Christ die? Was that a holy place? Is that a holy place? Is it a holy place? Come on now, somebody say it with me. Is it a holy place? Because you know what the Bible says? That the place where Jesus died is spiritually Sodom and Gomorrah. How about that? But, but, is it not a holy place? Isn't it? Here's the truth of that place. You ready? You ready? Now that we have, now that we don't have, uh, we don't have those folks who are trying to force an agenda, right? It's time for people to look at the map as it really is. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, it is written that a prophet shall not die outside of Jerusalem. That's what he said. It is written that a prophet shall not die out of Jerusalem. See, we have to do some more inspecting, don't we? We do. We can take the theologian version, right? Or, or we can go look again. I'd recommend people look again. In fact, I'd recommend you do your homework and find out who moved the lines and why they moved them. Because you, nobody can sit here and tell me that in 1948 at the UN General Assembly that they got the lines right. I'm sorry. The Lord knew what he was talking about. These are ancient words. These are ancient words. And the Lord said, it is written that a prophet shall not die outside of Jerusalem. See, mankind and Satan, he is devious and sneaky. He is seriously sneaky. But here's the part that hurts us. Where did human beings learn things from? Where? You ready? From each other. Uh-oh, we have a problem. The smartest of human beings has learned from another human being. Eh? See, I don't fall for that one either. I, it doesn't matter to me how smart somebody is, right? I'm telling you now, I've seen some pretty deep lies in my time. And so it makes the smartest people the most silliest folks I've ever seen because they believe in man's writings. And I'm talking about crooked man of today's world. The further back you go, the more honest they were, right? To write something crooked, you have to have the original notes somewhere. As we start doing things faster and faster and too much money got involved. Oh, people did anything and everything. It's getting worse. But think about that. You point out the strong, the smartest person in the world, right? Smartest person. I'm not going to hear everything you have to say. Because they're only going to repeat what another person said. Well, I get that from another person. In truth, I'm telling you, that's how it is. It really depends on what you think they're smart at. A smart person, me, is somebody who knows how to attract food on a tree bark. And that's a smart person. Somebody who can make a toy. He can calculate a few gears. When everything is up in flames, is that smart person going to be smart? He? No, they're not. What about a brain surgeon? Is he going to be a pretty, pretty prominent surgeon? If none of the electronics work? No, because his tool set will not work either. What about a person who's a tactician, right? Really good at war, organizing things for fighting. When there's about 5,000 people left on the earth, nobody is driving anything anywhere, if it ever got that way, right? Is that going to be an ingenious individual? No. Your environment props up that, you know, mindset. Academia is good. It's good. But to be smart, it's subjective. And it's very subjective. The average person out camping don't think their smartness in, is going to be out too well. But they won't know how to do certain things. Or they won't have the skill set to accomplish specific things. They can think of a bunch of ideas. So wouldn't that be based upon the environment? Sure it would. The smart people that are smart now on top of the world, as the world begins to the sea of vice, is going to plant this earth. Is that vice this earth? They're going to become less and less important. They will. In a twinkling of an eye, a snap of a finger. Everything that was on top is going to be on the bottom.
And those who are on the bottom are going to be on the top. Do you know why? Because there are people right now struggling. And what they have to do is they have to be creative. They can't go to the store and get everything that they want. They have to take what they can get. And they have to be creative for what they get. Okay? They have to know how to function and operate without conveniences. They have no idea that they've been kept also. I had a discussion two weeks ago with an individual about disease. So many kids have taken antibiotics. So many parents have taken antibiotics that if the world began to endure some sort of a virus and it's immune or, or well, you might as well say immune, immune to some of the uh, antibiotics that are out there. We could have a pandemic from the most harmless thing out there due to the problem with our immune systems. And that's due to too many antibiotics. Too many. There are already bacterial strains that will no longer respond to penicillin, things like that. And right now, there are certain types of viruses and bacteria that are now super viruses and super bacteria, but they were not like that 20 years ago. They're like that now because they have, these things have a resistance to every antibiotic out there. So they won't respond to it, right? And because just about everybody in the world, save certain tribes on islands and this and the other, and, and certain people who live near water that don't really take antibiotics, they would survive. But the majority of inland personnel will not. They wouldn't survive because they've taken too many antibiotics. Too many. So their systems right, won't be able to fight whatever ours does or whatever the period is. Weaken ourselves by spoiling ourselves. And so we did. And it's too late. It is. Somebody says that. But somebody had a hold on guys. Somebody question here. Now, but wait a minute, I want to mention something to you guys so you understand this. This woman that sits atop the beast is not part of the beast. That's what I wanted to tell you guys. I want you guys to know that the woman that sits atop the beast is not part of the beast. She sits atop the beast, and that word is used because the beast surrounds her. Right? The horns of the beast surround her. You guys got that? But she is not part of the beast. The beast hates her. So if the beast hates her, if the beast hates her, then what is she? She does have mystery Babylon written on her forehead, but the beast hates her. The beast hates her. And she is found right smack dab in the middle. I bet now some people say that's Rome. That's what they say. They say that's Rome, right? That's Rome. Um... But there's one telltale sign. See, Rome had nothing to do with Jeremiah's declaration. There's only one place on earth that had anything to do with Jeremiah's declaration. Listen, I want you to keep this in mind because this one place is the key to everything. The one place. Revelation 17, 17 says, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, listen, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now that's very important. The words of God being fulfilled refers to his indignation. You know when the Bible, when it speaks about God's indignation, his indignation is an appointed time. It's an appointed time. So all of you know that. It's an appointed time. There are scriptures like, tell his indignation be fulfilled. His indignation is upon one place on the whole earth. And that began through a small rebellious act, which caused an exile in Jeremiah. The indignation of the Lord was established in the book of Jeremiah. That's why Jeremiah the prophet was set in the first place. The indignation of the Lord is what this is about. And the completion of the process of salvation is connected to this place. It is the, now here's a dead giveaway. You ready? It is the mother of harlots, the first harlot. The mother of harlots, the first harlot. Who's the first harlot? Who was the first one that God ever called a harlot? Who did God call a harlot? Who did he call a harlot? 
and give you a hint. He said, I would have given you a letter of divorce. See, it's been here all this time. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's why I don't really talk about this too much. The prop is somebody said, Jezebel's a mother. No, she's not. The mother of harlots, right? The mother of all harlots. That was a phrase used by the prophets of old, right? In order to be a harlot, you had to go with someone out there. Now, back in those days, it was not like just a prostitute. That's not what a harlot was. It was a little more inclusive. So you had to belong to someone, right? You had to belong to somebody. And if you belong to somebody and go out and do something like that, commit adultery, you were known as a harlot. To commit adultery, to you had to be you had to be bound to some, to be that. Now, to be the mother of harlots means you had to be the very first harlot, which means you have to had whoever this harlot is, you had to belong to somebody, and it just couldn't be anybody. No, no, she didn't really belong to some. There's only one place on the earth that ever belonged to some. Somebody said Babylon, no one Babylon. Now remember, she has. Why would Babylon have Mystery Babylon on the forehead? If Mystery Babylon is on the forehead, great mother of harlots, right? But it's on the forehead, that is called a whore's forehead. That's what that is. When a person back then committed an act of adultery, they were stabbed. And everybody knew what they were. But see, uh, but let me say this. For many generations, it's been very popular to disassociate certain ideologies with that. To me, it makes perfect sense because I'm not spoiled with tradition, so to speak. The spoiled means I've been stopped. I'm, yeah, I didn't quite grow up on that. Could it be wrong? Sure, it could be. I hope it's not. I'm just going with what the Lord gave me, not with, I didn't get this from a book, and nobody else out there has, that I know of, you know, I don't know of anybody else who ever talked about this 20 years ago, except me. I, I just, because I didn't listen to anybody either. You guys, right? but I didn't listen to anybody else, right? But when I first saw this, I could see who it was. I could see. I know people have explanations for other places. That's fine, right? The biggest thing to me is this, because I love the New Testament. Every time I read the New Testament, it's almost like God's, Number one place, he never associated himself with any other place but the one place on this earth. And they could not stay with him faithfully. They just couldn't stay with him faithfully. They kept fornicating. They just continued to fornicate. God talked about the strongholds around her. Mm -hmm. Kept doing it. Now, from the Old Testament, you had places like Babylon, you had other places. When you go to the New Testament, you're going to notice something. Think about this, Gog and Magog in Revelation, the book of Revelation is the entire earth. It's not just one place, it's the entire earth. It's the four corners of the earth, or the four quarters, I'm sorry, of the earth, not corners, quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog. See that? So then a place, we are talking about Babylon. Babylon has fallen, right? In the Old Testament, it was a regional area. But that regional area became known for things. In the New Testament, places adopted the spirit of how these places operated. Babylon, at a certain part of the Bible, became the entire earth before it'll be Gog and Magog. See how that works? In the Old Testament, you're dealing with a regional place. In the New Testament, the spirit of that place is what's being addressed here. The spirit of that place. That's why he said, you know, Jerusalem was like a, or, I'm sorry, there, there are certain places that are spiritually like Sodom and Gomorrah. He called places of Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon. The whole earth in Revelation is called Gog, Magog. <laughs> that other words, it's in Revelation, Magog. So that's how you, I don't know what China, China is not a, China was not known by China in the ancient times, so. I don't know what that, that's in there for. Have you guys ever seen that revelation at the end? Read it at the end. God may go. Read it at the end. You'll see it. Because the entire earth had become God may go. Why? Why did the whole earth become God may go? Because Satan was loosed after the thousand years was expired. And he went out and deceived 
all the people again on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to bring them to that, that final day of battle. That, that was the ending, by the way, of a prophecy that was set a long time ago. That this Gog Magog thing, you're going to notice it comes up in spurts, like a battle that never ends. At the end of Revelation, all fulfillment takes place. It's almost like all prophecies are closing. At the end, all prophecies close. It's very interesting how the Lord does things. He, he, he says in Revelation 27, it says, And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be eased out of his prison. He shall go out to deceive the nation, which are in the four orders of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That matches what was in the Old Testament of the declaration that God said he wouldn't forget about that battle. He will. He will have that come to pass, right? The Gog, Magog battle will come to pass. And here we are in Revelation after Satan is loosed out of his prison, right? He goes out and deceive the nations which were in the four corners of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them to the, together to battle the number of, it says, so what do they do? It says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Didn't he say that he, when it comes to Gog and Magog, didn't he say that he would do exactly that? Yes, he did. So he's bringing everything to a close. Everything to a close. Right? See how that works? So right after this, he says, and I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged under those things which were written in the books according to the works. So it's all done by here. That's when the sea gave up the dead, and every all the dead was given up. That's the great, that's the last of the last. The Lord's awesome how he is faithful to bring everything to a close after his order, not man's order, right? Not by man's methodology, but by his declared times. He's doing exactly what he said he would do. All we have to do is hear him. Excellent. So now, back to Revelation 17. I'm about to take a break here in a minute. So you all can see this. The, the interpretation of the beast is right here in Revelation 17. I really didn't get into the woman yet. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about her. It's coming her, the four Babylon. We're going to talk about this woman, the four Babylons. We're going to talk about the fathers who had dealings with this, this place, the daughters of Babylon. How many daughters of Babylon were named that and why God went in to start telling people they were the daughter of Babylon in the first place. And what it all means, and, and at the end of that study, we might do it in that same day or the next, we'll get into the indignation of the Lord. Then we'll go into the declaration of the indignation. All of this goes with revelation. Yeah, because if you don't know about the indignation of the Lord, you'll never understand why Jerusalem has to be trampled underfoot 40 and two months. No other place on earth is going to be trampled underfoot by order of the living God because of his indignation except Jerusalem. And that's why the two witnesses were there. That's why they were there. All right. So that's Revelation. You know what the beast is, right? You also know that these, the 10, um, the 10 horns that are up on the beast that don't like the whore that sits atop the beast is, will agree and give their kingdom to the beast. One hour with the beast till the words of God should be fulfilled. So it is God, God. Who by, and listen, by order of the living God, these 10 kings gave their power, their authority, and all that to the beast. For what? To fulfill his will. That his indignation would be completed. So don't think for a moment, somehow, you've got to run away. Everybody gets this mindset. I got to get away from the beast. Your know, chances are, many of you, you may not be here. At the last quarter of the beast, that, that time, when that time comes, where you may not be here. This may not be here. All right, let's go back. We're going to go back. Back to Revelation 13. 
No. He just saw the beast. That was a beast. Right. That was a beast. Now let's look at the beast, the placement of the beast. What was this thing doing? I stood upon the sand of the sea, and the beast rise, rose up of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, and aims of blasphemy. And the beast I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power seat great authority. Side note, being like unto a leopard, feet as a bear, mouth as a lion. These are, these are primers in other books of the Bible. We're not going to cover those yet. What that means is it's a detail that overlaps other details that will give you even more information about the nature of this beast. So we will go into that, though, not right now. And his mouth, listen, and his, and, uh, his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, this is what you got to see, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now... I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now, remember, the heads are those hills, right? They're hills or mountains or hills. He saw one of the hills as it were wounded to death. But his deadly wound was healed. You guys know what those hills are, don't you? The hills are nations. That's what the hills are. Nations. The, the heads of the beast, right? They were described as being as this woman sits amongst these seven hills. Right? Those hills or mountains are nations. They're not people. And, and so as it, it says, and I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. The head is a mountain, which is a nation. So the head is a nation that was wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. So a nation was wounded. Right? Okay, let me get somebody said heels are leaders. No, heels are the nations. The horns are the leaders. Remember? The seven horns, which you saw, right? God told us what these were. It tells us what those were. Right, one more time. Now we're just going to do that one more time so everybody gets this. All right? Let you, are you ready, guys? And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the horns, shall make her desolate, and shall eat her flesh and burn with fire, for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give the kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. Do you see that? The ten horns, the ten horns, the ten horns, the ten horns. See that? Again, it says the ten horns for Saul Saurus are ten kings. So the horns are kings. Those are leaders. Kings are kings of nations, which are the heads of the beast. The heads are nations. The horns are the leaders of those nations. So you have seven heads. Ten horns. You see the heads, ten horns, are the nations. The horns are the leaders of those nations. Then one of those nations, two leaders, fell among the rings. But we'll get to that. Okay, back to 13. Now, you guys see that. We're going we're gonna to line down. We're going to line down. It's okay. Let's get lined down. That's how you line things out, right? That's how you get it all lined down. So this thing, the, the, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, it is great authority. Now, this is, this is not good. It's not good. Keep that in your mind. This thing looks just like the dragon. It looks just like the dragon. The only difference is the dragon has seven crowns, right? This thing has ten. So, and the dragon gave him his power seat great authority. Now, if you, if, if you want to give us some homework, Trying to find out what power, seat, and great authority is. You're going to find out it's the power, his seat, and his great authority. That's what his power, seat, and great authority is. The dragon gives that to the beast. The dragon is Satan, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. He copied him. What did he do? He did just what Jesus was telling us he was doing. He did just what God told the prophets he was doing. See, back in the Old Testament, the Lord talked to us about this dragon. He did. He told us what he was doing in the earth. And then Satan himself, when Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, was tempted of the devil. And what did the devil do? He said, you see all these kingdoms? He said, they're mine, and I can give them to whomever I want. And he wasn't lying either. He wasn't whistling Dixon. 
And he told Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, hey, I'll give them all to you. Right? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. So Satan said those kingdoms were given to him a promise. Promise. No wonder the beast looks just like Satan. And no wonder that the nations of this beast are ancient. Ancient, ancient, ancient. No wonder. But can you see some? A dragon is at the root of this entire world. The dragon is the foundation of every nation on earth. The whole nation of the dragon, Lord have mercy. Let me say this. Whatever's popular can't be right. Let me just say that. Whatever's popular cannot be right. Do you really think Satan would have his greatest mysteries popularized? Okay. No. And that's how he perpetuates himself. See, when we pick up stories and things, these stories are fed to us by other people. They are. They're fed to us. I, I'm spoiled. I told you guys that. Here's what, here's what, here's why I fall into play, right? About a long time ago, long time, I mean a long time ago, when I was uh, indoctrinated in the sun, I'd hear people, I'd hear conversations, and I'd begin to hear things I never heard before. And my whole world turned upside down. The history that people read that you guys know is not what they were talking about. And we're not talking about ordinary folks either. If we're talking about folks who make decisions for this world, they weren't talking the same history you guys were taught, like Washington. Right. We were all taught. Who was the first president? It's supposed to be George Washington. That's not what I heard. I didn't hear that. In fact, I know for a fact that people go have, they have pictures with empty, uh, the pictures are empty. They're on a wall. This thing is plaque in gold. It's in a very prominent place, teeing a bit before it ever gets to Washington. And they call them the founders. And it's one, one of those, one of those folks that out of the root of those folks has been one with every president that has ever been. Now, you don't, nobody teaches at schools. Like, it's like, I found out I was running around with half a truth. Like the history that we have was something they needed us to believe. Well, as it turns out, that's precisely what it was. They need people to believe the way they believe. Right now, people are doing exactly what they anticipated people to do. A lot of what you see is, oh, it's just like a movie. In the mo these movies that they make, right? People like these movies because sometimes these movies are kind of real, right? They make them look real, don't they? So does everything else. It looks real. It looks real. And when you're when, with academia, all you have to do is have one important person who's been hidden for a long time. Nobody can really see their credentials. They can just hear about them. If they present something, then everybody believes it. You stick something in a book and say it's from a very specific college. Everybody's going to believe it. Period. They're going to believe it. And essentially, that's what's happened. So it's not like we saw it ourselves. No, we took somebody else's word for it. Listen to me. That means we literally said, I'm going to believe this person. They're not lying. This is law. This is how it is. I'm going to live my life by it. Why won't we do that with the word of God? We question everything about the Lord's word, but we won't question Harvard, right? Especially when it comes to things about history dealing with our social structure and how things operate, who's where and what, you know, all this kind of thing. We fall for it every single time. And so right now in history, mankind is doing exactly what they've been predicted to do. Everything is heavily controlled. Your attitudes, the people don't like the government too much. They don't trust them. People are doing exactly what they want them to do. You don't think they know what would happen in Washington, D.C.? Come on. Come on. People knew they were stoking fires. I'm telling you, they need this to take place. But what do we do when we get their information? We make one mistake. You ready? We take their information and we try to decipher the word of God with man's corrupted tools. We don't have to do that. 
We don't have to do that. We don't. God gave us a filter. See, we know when we have something incomplete, something's wrong with it. We know that internally. We just have to learn to act on it. In other words, don't, I'm, I'm not going to push anything somebody pushed on me. I can't do that. And I separate everything from the Word of God. And even with the Word of God, you better believe it better have confirmation internally within me. Yeah, because I take no one's word for anything. We have internal confirmation of the truth. You guys know that, right? That's why when you read, listen, when you read the Word of God, you're sitting there reading along, and then you'll say, Amen. Now, how can you say that? Because you already know it. You could read something for the first time. In the Bible, this has happened probably to all of you. You've read something in the Bible, and you said, You know what? I, I thought that way the entire time. I should have stayed the way I was thinking because now there it is. Because you already knew it. So that when you read the Bible and a principle pops up or some something pops up that you know you're supposed to be doing or not doing, you already knew it. You knew it. That's internal confirmation. Nobody taught that to you. That's what your father put in. Now, that only works with the Word of God. It's quite amazing, isn't it? No other book brings that out but the Word of God. You can read the Word of God and you say, I did I knew that was the way it was. And they tried to teach me something different. I should have stayed. I should have kept. I should have kept it that way. Do you know how many things in my life I had altered a little bit to try and suit the atmosphere of the world, only to go back to the Bible and say, there it is. I should have stayed the way I knew it was the first time. Get excited because you... You, and you don't even put that together. You don't really realize that what you're doing is verifying your internal confirmation. Well, that internal confirmation has a name. That's the Holy Spirit. In the last days, God will pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. Oh, isn't that awesome? It's also your measure of faith. Not only do you have internal confirmation, but you have internal faith also. You have a measure of faith also. So when you get to topics in the Bible, like the beast and this woman and this and the other, there's some certain things God has not given confirmation for you. But he will. When, he, when, when things, when they're about to hit, you're going to have internal confirmation. You're going to know. And th so this part is important. We can have a thousand different ideas on who we think the woman is, who we think the beast is, who we think the dragon is, who we think all these people are. But know the scriptures so that when it happens, it'll fall into place. Just know the scriptures. Know the scriptures. See, as I know a lot of people with different ideas than I do about that, right? And I can hear what they're saying. I can't. I never sit there and detest what anybody is saying about that. You know, that's not what I'm here for. I kind of keep that. What the Lord gave me is mine. What he gave somebody else is theirs. But what I will do is keep the original scripture so that when the thing is revealed, I can identify it. If you know the scripture, when that time comes, you'll have identification. Of it. You will. And believe me, it'll be a blessing to your lives. So know the scripture. Know it. Sometimes we can know it only through somebody else's words. Be careful not to do that. Try to get to the uh, to the original source as, as original as you can find it. Take that one, right? That's why I like the King James version of the Bible. And you may have a different version you like. I try to get as close to the original as I can. I do because we know the further we get away, the further we get away, things happen. Things have. So get closer because God's going to be the filled. He is not going to hinge your salvation on somebody else's grammatical errors or sneaky tricks. That's not going to work. Nobody's going to trick you into hell. That's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And if you can't really stick with the King James version of the Bible, right? Then do, do whatever, whatever you, whatever you have, make sure you know the scripture. I would recommend getting as close to the original as possible. I used to have a little history thing. I put on a website, a history of the Bible through a documentary that was done pretty good. And I liked it so much. I said, I'm going to throw that up there. But it shows you the struggles in a very true story behind the Bible. 
as it was stopped a few times in history. And it came like, and, and again and again, the Lord did good to us. He is that, that, that book has gone through many trials, many things, and many people have tried to, you know, just put it away. It never happened. So thank God for that. Now, when I come back from this break, folks, because I'm talking too much, again, I don't want to overdo it either. I got kind of charged up on this because we're talking about prophecy. And we just so, it just so happens we live in a time and things are about to be uncovered. I'm still somewhat smashed, you could say, but it's, I'll be, I just know that you live in a time of an uncovering. Things will be uncovered. Things will be uncovered. Things must fall first. The thought of falling out, but things must be uncovered. When they are uncovered, right? I will not have a hindrance on it, right? Then I want to talk to you guys about some things, but I can't do it. I would sound like I'm, I'm a loony tune right now because there's no demonstration. But it will be. When there's demonstration, we can freely talk about it. I'm doing that based on spiritual instruction. I have to do that, right? But when there's demonstration, we're going to have a lot of supports. Somebody said, you're very tough, Mike. I'm very determined. If you're determined, you just simply keep going. That's what you do. I, I found something out. This is, this is outside of everything. I found something out in life. You guys ready for this? If you brag on something, you're going to set yourself up for failure. Have you noticed that anybody who brags on anything, they are challenged by what they bragged on and they will fail in what they bragged on, especially if they're a Christian. Why? Why does this happen? Because everything you speak, everything you speak, the Lord will try and save you from being a hypocrite, which means if you brag about something, you now have to undergo those conditions to qualify you so that what you spoke is not hypocrisy. If we speak hypocrisy, we cannot step foot in the kingdom of God. And so if you brag on something, you're going to have to go through those conditions to qualify yourself. Everything you speak must be qualified. Why? Because you're not just some normal person out here. You're the call. You're the chosen. That's who you are. And when you speak your vessels of holiness, so we believe in the Bible, right? We believe in Christ. We do. We do. So how come we don't believe that what we speak is kingdom, is based in kingdom authority? You think God's going to have his vessels just speaking anything? No. Be careful about what you brag about. There are areas of my life I've been highly qualified. And I can, I can speak on certain things in that. When it comes to bragging, no. No. I know who brings me through. And I know by, by what power I'm being sustained. I don't mean, nobody ever has to burn. Somebody said, you're very tough. I'll say this, I'm determined. If you're determined, the Lord's strength, your tough. Just be determined. Determined means you're going to do it no matter what. You're going to give it your best attempt. That's all. That's what determined is. That's, that's what it is. Once you're determined like that, the Lord is always your help. Here's the problem, though. Many of you, you found out that uh, you can't do everything for yourself. You're going to run out of steam. So don't do it for yourself. I don't do anything for me. I must have an external motive. I must have a motive connected to somebody else. Out of love, not obligation to continue going. Did you guys get that? They don't even understand it. They don't. There are open rituals that they hold, and people partake of it all the time. I can't even talk about them until they're made public, but I'll tell you, I keep telling people, when they're made public, you're going to have at least 80% of Christians repenting for ever taking part in it because they seem harmless, and they're not harmless. They're not harmless. But you can't just tell anybody that. Suppose you guys enjoy a satanic activity that you were taught was good and wholesome. Did you ever know it was a satanic activity when the world has a practice of doing it? And this is how they hide it. Listen to me. If the world did not embrace it, you could easily see something wrong with it. But when the world embraces it, 
when you're indoctrinated to interact with it. From day one, you cannot see it. You have been made effectively blind to it. And your senses have been nullified in that area because you're going to constantly weigh it against what you see, what you perceive. And nobody is saying it's wrong. And so guess what? You can't see it. You cannot see it. When it comes out of what it actually is, that'll be a day of freedom like none other. Somebody said like baseball, Rick 777. When you, there's so many things like that. When you find out that society is based in actual ritual things, right? And I mean, they have gone to great lengths to write up a history in it, right? You'd be surprised how many things are falsified, how many things are just not true, how many things in history are just not true, and people believe it blindly. Again, they won't believe the word blindly, but they'll believe the institutions blindly. And why do they believe institutions? Here's why. Because we have computers that work, we have cars that work, we have medicine that works, right? We have you know, different methods and things that people have made and created, they work. And so you look at a computer, instantly jump to the institution and say, well, you know, that's working. It'd be, you know, perfect. This took a lot of brain power. So everything else must be true too. That's where we mess up. If you look at the model of Satan in the garden, did Satan lie at all? Did he lie at all? He didn't lie, not as we see him. Because Satan said, Satan said, Eve said that. Uh, Eve said, well, uh, Satan said, what, what, uh, can you eat of all the trees in the garden? And what did Eve say? She said, no, we can, we can, we, we can eat of all the trees except that one. God said, in the day we do, we're going to truly die. He said, you won't, you won't really die. God knows that when you, in the day you eat thereof, you're going to be like, he is going good from evil, right? That's what he said. And so when they ate, they were confronted. And what did God say? Man has become like one of us, unless he put forth his hand to the tree of life and live forever, right? So he told them the truth, but his intent was twisted, which makes it a lie. When the intent is to get you to disobey the living God, to get you to live against the living God, right? Then the whole thing is a lie. It's a lie. So Satan coming close to them, acting like he was trying to free them, that was a lie. His intent was cricket. Everything else was a lie. Even when he told the truth of the method or of the way to do it, the whole thing was based in a lie. He's still alive. And he murders that way. He kills that way. Do you guys know about the games in ring? You guys know about those why do they start those games? Anybody do any of uh, them? Surely you guys went through history to see what that was all about. Well, they had the gladiators out there, right? Was that for, you know, the king? Was it for the people or the king? You ready? It was for the, it was for the people. Why did they do that for the people? How could that help the people? It was an avenue, an avenue of their cravings, of their internal lusts. Because they had rules in Rome, right? They had rules, and they, there were certain things they couldn't do, and violence started breaking out. And people were pressured, and people had no outlet for their emotions. People used to, people used to talk, I didn't do it anymore, but they used to say, I just, you know, I just have to vent to someone. And I, was, I started to tell people, vent. Well, venting is nothing but murmuring and complaining because nobody can do anything about somebody's venting, right? So Christians should not vent. They should hurt, not vent. Because if you start talking about a bunch of stuff, all you're doing is complaining. That's it. Murmuring and complaining. Venting helps. It helps nothing. The games came about to give an outlet for the bloodlusts of people. And they found out when they had the game, so when people beheld violence, right? When they beheld violence and death and all that stuff, they were, it was actually an outlet 
for their own violence, for their own misfortune, right? And so the games spread all over the world. They, you're, you're talking about something that uh, people from all lands came to see, and the idea became popular, and they had people. They would gladly throw people into these arenas all over the world and have people kill each other, and people would eat it up and love it. But why? Because when you see somebody else fighting, you may not know this. You, when you, when you partake of that, you are doing the same thing. You're just not feeling the effects. You have the same grunts. That's why you can, uh, if you watch something too much, you're involved in, in certain things. You'll have the same grunts, the same feelings, the same everything, right? You're a partaker of what you're seeing. Just a partaker, which is a relief point, right? You're letting out certain things that you ordinarily would have no outlet to. That's what they didn't learn. God taught his people how to purge. People never needed that. Earthly man needed that. God's people never did. If, if the average person, you can put yourself through the test too to see, to put your, your flesh in check, right? And, and to put your flesh in check is to see where your flesh meter is. With all of these things in the world, you don't know how strong your flesh is. I'm telling you right now, your flesh is stronger than you think. Much stronger than you think. You have an outlet, though. People have multiple outlets, right? They don't know how strong their flesh is. When you take everything away, that's when your flesh starts to back up on you, right? I've seen people. There was a power outage one time. Right? The sixth day of the power outage, people were going nuts. They were. COVID-19, for example, too many divorces happened during COVID-19. Nobody had an outlet. They were stuck in their home with their partner and kids. They were at home with their families, and they couldn't take it. They couldn't go out and shop. They couldn't go out and do this. They couldn't go out and do that which means their flesh is hungry. And if they don't feed their flesh, their flesh is going to take over. They don't even know that they have that weakness. They don't know. If they keep camouflaging, how? By partaking in things externally from them. And there are lots of things set up like that. So that when it is cut off, you're not going to have the control you think you're going to have. What would happen if everything suddenly shut down you know what, the, one of the number one fears in, in, um, in people's minds in America is the power outage, like a, a CME or something like that takes down the power grid. People say, well, I can't live without that. I got to have, you know, I got to have music. I got to have this. I got to have that. And put themselves through the test. There's a reality we're going to have to face. We have comforts around us so much that we have misgaged how strong our flesh is. A lot of people think, listen, there were times I thought I had overcome certain aspects of my life until my flesh woke, right? In other words, I did not know that certain things in my flesh were being pacified by society or by the world, by things that were set up in institutions, so on and so forth. And when all that's taken away, you find out what you're all about. You do. You really find out what you're all about. Right now, what your flesh is, is hidden because the world is working and the world stops working. That's when you find out what your flesh is all about, what it's actually craving. Unless you begin to do the responsible thing, find out yourselves and submit every area of resistance, every area, so that you have no handicap. For me, I didn't want a handicap. I didn't want a handicap. I did not want to change, right? I didn't want uh, this mental change. Should something cease? Should something stop? Should things alter? Right? I didn't want that. So I would go through times where I would just, you know, take the whole circuit breaker and flip it off. I'd go through moments, but I didn't have anything but bare necessities all around me for days, months, right? Look, I do creative things because I will never have a handicap. See, when I broke, when, when I was broken of that, 
I know how easy it is to go back. I will not deceive myself again. I deceive myself the first few times. I will not do it again. I will not deceive myself again. Not going to do it. God has given me the mind, right? A little know how to start, uh, you know, saying no, to see the true gauge of my flint. And it's not going to go back up to full again. Full means full of everything it needs so it can shut up. Because essentially, that's what we do. Your stomach growls, you go get something to eat, right? For what? To stop your stomach from growling. You get sleepy, you go to sleep. You want this, you go get it. You want that, you go get it. But what happens when you can't go get it? What happens when you're, when you can't go to sleep? What happens when you have to defy things of the flesh? What I'm telling you is this. For those of you who have not gone through it, you find yourself in circumstances where you cannot think right because your body is so long, overrides everything else. And when, when that was, when, I, when that was broken, I said, nope, I, I have to be in charge. I have to spiritually be in charge of everything about the flesh. You cannot give an inch to the flesh. You're just going to want too much. So there's some, there's certain things I'll never be. I'll just never be certain. I'll never be, I'm always going to be in some type of shape because everything I do is by necessity. You know how you eat for enjoyment? Because you're, there, there are certain foods I used to love the taste of. Oh, I got to go eat this because I just love how that tastes and this, that, and the other. I haven't done that so many years. I eat out of necessity, not because my stomach hurts, right? Do so I never uh, indulge too much? Never do that. I can eat the same. I, uh, it was last year, I believe. Last year, I ate two specific things the whole year. Who could eat two meals a day of the exact same thing for the whole year? So that's eating out of necessity, not for taste, but for nutrients. Now, if I believed, if I personally believed that we were headed for a very difficult time, why would I not prepare myself for that time? Newsflash, strongly believe, I strongly believe that I have an idea of what we're headed toward. And I'll not be cut short in that field. I have to be able to operate and function and encourage. I can't be discouraged because I won't be able to encourage anybody else. I have to be of usage during that time, right? Usage. And I said, rice and beans? No, I don't eat beans at all. No beans for me. All right, let's continue, guys. Let's continue. So, what time is it? Oh, my goodness, Greg, what's wrong with me? I'm going to get chewed out. I told someone, I said, look, quite up to par, yeah. Professional, I told them, said, they diagnosed me. I was told to keep everything to a limit, possibly around 30 minutes. I guess that didn't work, did it? Anyway, so let me finish this. It was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Hey, you guys know what that 40 and two months is, right? It keeps popping up that three and a half years. That just so happens to be the, the exact time of the indignation or the time span of the indignation of the Lord. And he opened his mouth speaking. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. So he opens up his mouth and he blasphemes his name, Christ, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Now find this funny. Listen. He blasphemes his name, right? That's one. His tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So we have those that dwell in heaven. We have his name, but he's not blaspheming us. Those who follow him, sure he is. Because what did Jesus say you were? You're the tabernacle made without hands. You are. Are you not? You're the tabernacle made without hands. He, that's what you are. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred and tongues and nations. Now listen, it says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred and tongues and nations. How many of you are frightened by that statement? 
it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Uh-oh. See? 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 Because most people, what do they say? What do most people say? What do people say? I'm not going to be here when that stuff starts. Right? But they were here in World War I, Civil War, right? British firing cannonballs at the coast in America. People were, they were here. World War II, they were here. World War Three, I believe it's already begun. We're still here. We are. And so, um, what is everybody talking about? Here's the problem. They're frightened of what the Lord is doing. He frightened. Terrified. Why would you be terrified of what the Messiah is doing? Why would you be frightened of what you've already been living within? And we need context for this, don't we? We can't make it to what we want. See, this is where a person can accept the truth or deny because see, me, me, but God, God has given us examples. Just for those of you, right? Who don't like this scripture? Power was given to him to overcome the saints, right? To make war with the saints and overcome them. He gave us some context. What war is he talking about? Well, we just heard he was given a big mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. You just read that he blasphemed, right? The tabernacle, those that dwell in the heavens, in the name of the Lord. Who has a big mouth? And he wages war against the saints, and he overcomes them, right? And power is given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. To overcome a saint, how do you do that? You need a reference in the Word of God, do you? How was Israel overcome? How were God's people overcome? How were the saints overcome? When you have context, Saints, well, that's different than somebody who's walking around thinking about salvation. A saint is a devoted person, somebody accepted by the living God, somebody in the will of God, somebody in the will of God who's going to keep those things of God. So they were disrupted for keeping things of God. A saint will keep things of God in the physical form, like the Sabbath day, praise and worship. Things of that nature. A war on the saints would be to take all that away. Just like this man of perdition who calls us oblation. Right? Worship is going to cease in Jerusalem. All these physical things that people do is going to stop. The wolf is coming. You know what the wolf hunts? Does the wolf congregation or the pastor? The wolf hunts the pastor. Just so you know that. In the biblical context, the wolf is coming for the pastors. He's not coming for the, for the uh, sheep. He's coming for the, that shepherd over the sheep. That's who the wolf is coming for. But all that wolf is going to do is to succeed and run off all the hirelings. He's going to run off everybody who did what they did for money. In other words, if, if being a shepherd is not in your heart, is not in your soul, is not in your spirit. You're going to fold up like a lawn chair. Just not going to be there because the balances are not going to be balanced. The trouble is going to be far, far more than anybody has ever dealt with. And people are going to say it's not worth it. I'm not losing my life just to talk about this or just to talk about that or just to do this and just to do that. That's how you run the hirelings off. See, when God does something like this, because God is allowing this beast to overcome the saints, and you have to ask yourself, okay, Lord, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Well, he just told us he was going to allow the wolf to come to run off all the hirelings. So everybody who was out there, who did not have the right spirit, that is, that faithful spirit, all these people posturing like they love the Lord and their teachers and this and the other, but their hearts are not with the living God. They're going to be run off. And the only thing that will remain are those who are dedicated to Christ. Mm -hmm. Because how many people would lose their lives 
See, it's just like now, a lot of people say God is good. They tell everything goes wrong. And let's see, let's see who says God is good. Wait till their bodies are broken. And let's see who says God is good. What you're going to find is a lot of people. You're not going to find them anymore. Well, what happened to so-and-so? Well, you know, they, uh, they went through this moment. You know, it's better for they got to just take a side of, or they get, they have to, you know, take their little vacation and get some rest. And I don't believe they can do that. Or what about when you go in there, you're talking about the Lord and then everybody the next day curses you out. Well, it was too much pressure for so-and-so, so they can't do it anymore. IRS had come for you. Well, what well, they can't, they, they can't do it anymore. And too many worldly pressures. They only, let me tell you something. If, if, if the Lord's word is in your heart, that there is nothing in this life that can stop you with what burns within you. Nothing can stop that. You don't walk around with your own words. You're walking around with somebody else's words, with the most high's words. You can't just shut that up and ball that up. Circumstances will never dictate when that comes out. You're not going to have in your notes what you're going to release either. The Lord will guide every step of the way. And you don't care. You, I'm telling you right now, what you're going to care about is getting that word, doing that activity, whatever it is, to where God needs you to do it. You don't care what you say. That's part of the wall. You're not going to back down. If everything blew up in your household, you're still going to go forward. See, the Lord has been trying people in small steps. That's why I will never say, Lord, take the opposition from me. I don't want that because I'll become weak. If I'm not tried, how in the world can I ever, ever hope to withstand what's coming? The Lord just gives us a workout. You know, when you go to a gym, right? You lift up a weight, it opposes you. And the more you can lift that opposes you, even the more, the stronger you become. You will not become strong if you cannot pick up something that opposes you. You will become strong if you pick up things that oppose you more and more. That's what a workout is. You pull something up, it pulls you right back down again. That's what a workout is. And the more it pulls against you, the heavier the weight, the stronger you become. This thing, this thing, the Lord's allowing it. Let me give you guys an example of something of what the Lord does. I'm going to read something you probably, maybe you never heard this before. I'm going to read it. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathed this light bread. We hate this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bite the pe and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bidden, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bidden any man, when he had beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Then you see what the Lord did here. See what the Lord did. You see what he did? You know how a lot of people say, well, you know, they create a problem and they have the solution. Well, the Lord did that first for anybody else did it. Even before the crooked people got a hold of it. But the Lord is doing this for a reason. I don't like, who likes serpents? I don't like serpents, especially poison ones. I don't like those things. So a bunch of poisonous vipers started biting people and they were dying. And when they prayed to the Lord, the Lord gave a solution to Moses a faithful solution, as he always does. And if they obeyed the Lord, they lived. But the conditions were tough. But if they obeyed the Lord, so the first thing was the conditions degraded. Snakes were all over the place. 
Some people die. Then they prayed. They prayed. They simply prayed. And when they prayed, God gave Moses instruction. And when the people, right, and the people obeyed the Lord, looking upon the pole with the brass serpent, they lived. They lived through obedience. Why did they die in the first place? And I'm going to read it to you. They went into the wilderness, and it says, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, because of the route they traveled, because of the, in your case, it would be because of the life you lived, because of the route they traveled, they were discouraged internally. Oh, this is, I'm never going to get any further than this. This is it. You know, all these things that people have. In the, this is Numbers 21.4 through 21.9. And the people spake against God and against Moses. So they murmured and complained. And they said, oh, I don't think God cares about us anymore. Yeah, they were just full of themselves, right? Then they said to Moses, and to God, why have you brought us up here? They said to Moses, why have you brought me here? They said to God, Lord, why did you do this? Or it sounds just like us. How many times have we in life said, God, why did you, why did you uh, set this? Why did you allow this to happen? Why do I have to be here? That's murmuring and complaining. And that tempts the Lord our God. Because when we do that, we act like he's the child and we're the parent. When they did this, oh, and then, then there was, he says, they also complained about the bread. They said, there's no bread, there's no water. And this light bread we hate. Why have we been taken out from Egypt, a place of bondage? Yes. A place of cruelty? Yes. Some of you saying the same things. At least it was a place. I didn't like the conditions. But now look. Now look. See, they were delivered and did not understand the process of deliverance. They get out there in the wilderness. And when it w did not suit them, why? Because they never tested their own flesh. Can you imagine? They, oh, yes, we can do it. They got out there a little bit, got hungry, instantly depressed. Well, I didn't, I didn't think it would be like this. That's how some of us do in our lives. I didn't think it'd be like this. God, why did you do this? And why did you do that? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm afraid to say that. God, why did you do this? And why did you do that? Because that's highly disrespectful. I had a soldier one time. And this, this soldier, in the middle of something very important, he said, uh, sir, uh, why did you? And when he said that, right, I could feel, it. I could just feel contempt. I could feel it. It was at the wrong time. There was no admission I gave to this fella, and he did it anyway. And I could just feel the, the oozing disrespect. I could feel it. When children say that to their parents, it does something to me. Why did you, why, when a child will question a parent, that child, how much regard does that child have in that? That's strange to my ears. I know what respect is. Therefore, I know what disrespect is. I know what honor is. I know what no honor is. There is no honor in a statement where someone, a child, whatever question, the parent, there's no honor. It's one thing to say, can you explain to me how, how you did that? Right, that's one thing. Not to say, why did you do that? Right? That is absolute disrespect, no honor, and second-guessing the authority in that vicinity. No. So when people down here on earth say, God, why did you do that? They're saying, I don't like the way you're raising me, is what they're saying. I don't like the way you're raising me. How arrogant we are. And in their case, Prince were let loose on serpents, poisonous serpents, like cobras, right? Of various types. And people died. And then after they were, you know, running their mouth to God, and the serpents came out, people died. They were instantly humbled and afraid because it was a plague of snakes on them on them in the wilderness until they prayed. When they prayed, 
the man who was leading them by the living God, received the answer. And if they obeyed God to go to the man God put in charge at that moment in time, they'd be okay. The Lord does the same thing now. You find yourself in a bad position, a bad position. And the truth be told, when, for the most part, when people say, God, why did you do this? It's one thing to say that in tears. It is. It's another to say it in anger. Because when you're angry, you're defiant. When you're defiant, you're not speaking from any godly source, but from a fully rebellious source within yourselves. And when this happens, the consequence is coming. If not for the grace of God, of the Lord. We'd all be dead. Every time we say, why did you do this? We tempt the Lord our God. You were told by Christ not to do that. Do not tempt the Lord God as they did in the desert, murmuring and complaining. Because when you complain, you're saying you don't like the way your father is raising you because he's setting up every situation in your life. You don't have to ask him why, but we should ask him, Lord, instruct me, show me, because I know you're speaking to me. I just can't, I can't see it right now. See, most people are so offended by something happening to their flesh because they truly think that's all they are. You're not your flesh. You're not your flesh. Your flesh is going to be discarded. If you're alive at the last trump, not the first trump, not the second, not the third, fourth, fifth, but at the last trump, if you're alive, and the Lord comes, you'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye. You're still not going to be in that flesh. You will get rid of that flesh. You are not your flesh. You're the spirit bound to that flesh for time. In your flesh hurts, that's still your flesh. That's not you. Won't you know these principles? You start looking at scripture, it's like the beast shall overcome them. Then Jimmy cracked core. Because this is our father's plan. This is his creed. Of course, he has a solution of deliverance. That's why I never need to worry. Because why? What did he promise us? He promised us one thing. One thing that is, it just outpaces everything else. Anybody know what that is? He promised us that he would deliver us, didn't he? He would deliver us. Remember that. So all this time right now, I'm going to have to stop in a minute to saying the data things are dropping. But all this time has been good training. Good training for the part of the process. Part of the process that we live in, right? That we're on the going. This is indeed a process, and it will determine everything. But take note, your Savior, your Savior is part of this process. Your Savior is the one that unloosens the seals. Nobody else has authority to loosen the seals. Your Savior loosens the seals. Stop being afraid of what your Savior is doing to complete your process. All this is necessary for the completion of the process. You don't have to be afraid of it. You don't walk with the Lord through whatever he has you go through. Because whatever you go through is going to be for your deliverance. He's doing what he's doing that you can be delivered. Why would anybody want to escape their own process of being fully delivered? So then all we have to be is committed and trusting. Hmm? Committed and trusting. And for your life will not be ruled by fear. Because when people read this, they get fearful. And they want to go and close the book as though it's going to make Revelation go away. Is that going to go away? You are living in that. You're living in that time now. So have the understanding. This is your father's process. For you, it's for your deliverance. For those who embrace the beast, well, you'll find out what they're 